Hey everyone, Vancouver Radio, episode number 201. How about that? Rachel, 201. Last week was episode 200. I was on my own. Bit of a milestone. It is. This is, you know, fingers crossed for this one. Third time lucky we're going to get this one in. Because uh, Ben and I have had a bit of a nightmare over Skype and connections over the past couple of weeks. So uh, here we are. Don't worry, we'll do this. Um, it was yeah. really nice to get a good handful of messages on Facebook and Twitter and places and say, well done on 200 episodes, keep going. So that was really nice for anyone that did that. Thank you very much. I tried to reply to everyone that I can if I didn't. And I apologise. Uh, I'm pretty good at individually replying to everyone. So, yeah, um, as you know, currently there is a shorter Monday show, uh, which was episode 200. Again, if you have a question for this podcast, even whether we do it on a show like this with me and Rachel, or I answer the question on a short Monday show, email bencoomba at gmail.com with the subject line podcast and I will put your question into the mix. Um, if you haven't been listening to the podcast for long and you're new to the show, please maybe wait till you've gone through a bit of the back catalogue, then ask a question, and then we'll make sure it's all relevant and we haven't covered it before and that kind of stuff. Uh, so, yeah. So, um, I, if you're watching this on YouTube, I've been doing a couple of podcasts recently in my vests. Um, it's not because I'm feeling all hench or anything. It's just flipping hot. It's just humid all the time at the moment. And I think I'm hotter because it's hay fever season and I'm sitting here and I'm all like sniffly and blocked nose and that kind of stuff. So um, to anyone that's suffering hay fever at the moment, I feel your pain. I think it's pretty bad that, that at the moment. Like I never get hay fever and even like I've started to get like itchy nose and sneezing and stuff. So um, I've been on the antihistamine, so I think it, it must be pretty bad. So if you are affected by hay fever, I'm sure it's really bad. Yeah, yeah. I have one request for hay fever. Hay fever, kindly fuck off. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Uh, so me and Rachel are back. It's been a little while. We will uh, be doing a Q and A show today. We've got two uh, big questions. Um, Bear with us, they are some long ones, but there's some good context here. Rachel's already told me she's fired up uh, by some of these questions to get stuck in. So, um, Rachel, should we dive into the show? Let's just dive in, shall we? Okay, so um, this question is from... Murray. Oh, God, it's so long, it goes over three pages. Murray. Murray. Hi, Ben and Rachel. I've been listening to the show for about 18 months now, and I always look forward to the po podcast popping up on a Thursday on iTunes. It gives me a lot to think about when I listen to it, and it's always full of quality stuff. Keep it up if you don't mind. Over that time, I don't think I've ever heard you cover this topic, although similar topics have been covered, and this topic is mindful binge eating. Bit of a background. I'm a 31 year old male at five foot nine, and I weigh. And last time I weighed in, I was 50, at 79.5 kilos. My activity choice is mid to long distance running, which I seem to have a knack for. PBs of one hour and 22 minutes for the half marathon, and two hours 65 56 for the full marathon. I train most days, doing five days of running and two days of cross training, um, which is body attack, body pump, and yoga. Although I'm struggling to stick with body pump as I just don't enjoy lifting weights, I enjoy high intensity training workouts, etc. But I'd rather go for a run for an hour than lift weights for half an hour. I do a lot of walking as well. I do around 15,000 to 20,000 um, steps worth of steps per day as I'm not a big fan of being inactive unless I'm doing something good such as uh, the TV or cinema. My biggest stumbling block that I feel is binge eating like mad. If it wasn't for all of the activity, I would well, I would be a lot heavier. I can be good for a few days, but as soon as I do, I then fall off the wagon, and I really go off the wagon. I've been using my fitness pal for almost five years now. It was a massive help when I first decided to lose weight, and it got me down from 90 kilos, 90.5 kilos when I started to 77.7 um, by my target weight. Uh, my target date of a summer holiday that year, um, a nine-month gap. I don't always shy away from entering foods, and I'm mindful of everything that goes into my mouth. So when I do have one of those binges, and it all goes into my fitness pal, 
So I can see that I easily hit 8,000 to 10,000 calories in a day. So I've learned the calorific value of food. At the moment, I've set my targets to 2,400 calories, but that has been a very rough a very rough guide as these days I can average 3,000 to 5,000 over the course of a week. My work is a nightmare. Um, there is always sweets and treats in the kitchen area and they don't last long either. By the time they have gone, um, I, I have eaten at least, uh, but by that time they have got, but by that time they've gone, um, I've eaten easily six donuts, four cookies and 30 odd sweets um, that come in the big tin two slices of cake, etc. And on top of that, um, everything that's brought in, that I've brought in to eat. Um, repeat that another day that week and that soon adds up. It's not just work. When I go out to the parents and in-laws, you get fed until you pop. Um, out and about all day, it's not unusual for me to have two bits of cake with my morning drink and then and lunch, lunch out and then dinner out. Buffets are also a nightmare for me. I tend not to go for them although at times they can't be avoided. For example, I went away um, for a weekend away with the wife to a hotel in the middle of nowhere. All they did was a buffet breakfast, and that was my calories gone for the day um, each morning by 9 a.m. At home, it varies. We, have some, we do have some treats in the house which don't last long. We can have n- nothing treat-wise for weeks in the house, and so that also helps control things. It seems that once I start, I can't stop. Even when I feel like I'm about to burst, I can still fit in that one last donut. I know all of the tricks. I chew gum, um, put stuff out of sight, don't start, don't, um, I don't bring in money for canteen treats. Nothing has really worked. I try and not start, but I don't know. I just start. I have to get up from my desk and to go and to get the treats, which doesn't put me off. The gum just goes into the bin next to the treats and I eat. It does get me down in a big way, even before the shame of this email, even the shame of this email when it comes when it comes out um, to say uh, that it's at the bottom. Be quick before Mary gets it. Be be quick before Mary gets them. It doesn't put me off though, and that's a real downer for me. I want to get back to my pre-marathon wedding honeymoon weight of around 72 kilos. So when I run, it doesn't feel like I'm dragging a heavy, heavy weight around on the runs, even though binge, although binge eating is making this very difficult. Even trying the 5-2 diet or any other form of fasting doesn't help. I know it's willpower. I know it's a lack of willpower or self-control. Um, I just don't know what it is. Surely I can't be the only person like this. Any thoughts? Thank you very much for your time, Mary. Now, Rachel, I know you said before we started this, you were kind of a bit fired up by this question and stuff, but I've actually only really got one comment. Willpower. Okay, you... You are? So you you go for your first comment, and um, whilst I make a little note on here because I've thought of more things to say. Well, willpower and self control are, you know, they're infinite. We can't, we don't have tons of it. We've only got a certain amount basically each day. Um, and the thing that Murray's trying to do is self restrict, and then is wanting to do things. And for me, the simple solution is that day to day. And we've been over this on the podcast before, so this might be the last time we ever mention this because I don't like to repeat information. You don't eat enough. You can't go out for runs lasting an hour, doing body pump. Like All of these things are burning five, 600 calories per hour because you're doing intense training. So if you're eating 2,400 calories a day and walking nearly 20,000 steps, you're pretty damn active. Your calories should be right up there. You should be eating probably at least an extra 1,000 calories a day, at least. So if you add that up, let's say you started on a Monday. Monday, you ate 2,400 calories and you're okay. Tuesday, you eat 2,400 calories and you're okay. Wednesday, you're already 2,000 calories down. Your body hasn't recovered well enough, hasn't replenished glycogen efficiently enough. It's starting to get a little bit tired. As soon as you get tired, both physically and mentally, you will crave sugar, without a doubt. All of us do it. 
The human brain is programmed to crave sugar when it's in a non-optimal state. Usually the only time I crave sugar is not actually when I recover inefficiently because I eat like a badass, like this, I never have any problem not eating enough. It's when I get tired or I get ill. As soon as I get a bit ill, I want sweet stuff. So I just have like, I mean this is a personal trick of mine, but I drink more diet ginger beer. It takes the edge off what I'm feeling when I'm ill or a little bit run down. Now, your body, let's say on a Wednesday, going back to my example, is fed up. Your body is fed up of not having enough glucose, glycogen and inefficient recovery. So when you get confronted with a donut tin, your brain is actually saying, you need to eat that donut tin. It's as simple as that. Your body, you haven't given it enough food. It's your fault. You've miscalculated your energy expenditure and your calories and tried to be overly restrictive. And even when you're trying to you know, be on a fat loss plan, you can't overly restrict. You have to go slow. This is why even the government are saying, go slow with your nutrition when you're trying to lose body fat. Aim for one to two pounds of fat loss a week because otherwise you're going to get tired, run down, have inefficient recovery, low mood, low libido. I could go on. So I think that's part of the problem. You say that you're only doing this maybe twice a week, doing this kind of binge and restrict, and you know you're doing it. Sometimes I know I'm doing it, but it's, to me, it's your fault in the first place for miscalculating your energy expenditure, and all your body's doing is, Murray, eat that tin of donuts because I'm fed up of having no glycogen. I totally agree, and that was going to be my first point, is that under... Like just massively under eating and over exercising, you know, fat loss is really not that hard. It's it's really not. Um, and you know, you can still enjoy, you know, um, in, more so endurance events. Um, and be eating more. So I'm not going to say any more on that. Um, what I will say is that you know, this is like binge eating is a, a, a huge, huge topic. And I've actually just finished writing a. I don't want to call it an ebook. It's like a mini guide on on binge eating. Um, and you know, we, we have a, a six-week coaching program, especially for binge eating with, with Chase Life. And binge eating is what we call an away-from behavior. So there's, there's several different aspects of binge eating, one of which, of course, is if you don't have enough calories, then your body goes out and it and it looks for calories because that's what you need to survive. Now, the other side of binge eating is that it's an away-from behavior. So you essentially, you're, you're running away from something that you don't want to address now for some people um obviously this is a self-sabotaging behavior so for some people it's food for some people it's alcohol some people it's drugs some people it's cigarettes and some people it's all all the above now to recover from binge eating you there are several steps that we take um in our program to, to help women now this obviously applies to men as well so the first one for recovery, you've got to be on what we call baseline nutrition. So baseline nutrition um, and obviously mindset coaching at the same time. So baseline nutrition for us is essentially uh, going back to baseline. Now, what we define as baseline is, for example, four meals a day at the right caloric intake. Now, we help set those standards. Now... We do not um, advise calorie counting um, in order to be able to do this, particularly tracking with MyFitnessPal. And, you know, we see plenty of clients who have tracked um, their, their food intake and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, if you do it over for a period of a week or so just to see where you're at, like this is not like a long-term thing. If you've been tracking calories for five years, you know, that's not a life-enhancing behavior. So... We teach baseline nutrition. It essentially helps you become more relaxed around food and calorie counting. It can be a precursor to neurotic behavior. Now, you know, we can have the debate of should people count calories? And there are certain times within one's nutritional plan that if you're plateauing, then yes, you should have an idea of where your calories are at, but it shouldn't be a lifestyle pattern. And, you know, this essentially if you're counting calories like this it does lead to that sort of restrictive dieting mindset now when you go into that restrictive dieting mindset you then have this proverbial wagon that you're either on or you're off so you then label food good food or bad foods and if you have a bad food 
which Murray has said he has a bad food, you then technically have a bad day because there's always an element of perfectionism related to something like this because you want to do it perfectly. And if something isn't done perfectly, then it's bad. It's a bad food. It's a, it then turns into a bad day. So, you you know, you then think, oh, well, fuck it. Like, I'll start again Monday. I'll start tomorrow. Essentially, what happens is that when you do have a bit of a taste of sugar, going back to what you said, Ben, your brain says, oh, shit. I've got more dieting around the corner. I'm just going to consume as much as I can now and I'm going to get as many calories as I can because, fuck, I know that dieting is just around the corner. It's probably going to start tomorrow. So I'm going to go for everything now. I'm just, I'm just going to go for it. So there is no such thing as willpower when it comes to something like this. Like I really feel that when we're looking at binge eating, it's, um, it's, it's about state management so Murray has and everybody else goes into these particular states and that you know it might be a, a state of anxiety it might be a state of um, frustration it might be a state of boredom generally speaking these are the kind of states that are involved around binge eating now one of the telltale signs for me is that the Murray said here um, I walk 15 to 20,000 steps a day and I'm not a big fan of being inactive now, the reason why people don't, don't like being inactive and they don't like downtimes because they have to listen to what's going on up here in your brain. You have to actually take stock and you have to take, you actually have to sit still and take a long, hard look at your life instead of burying your head in work, burying your head in binge eating, burying your head in drugs, alcohol, um, and any other addictions that you might have. So, so I, I kind of want to just highlight what you said there in case it's kind of missed mm. on your run in the what you're now telling people is to really, and we've been on this before, really analyze your patterns of why. Now, Excellent. if Murray is genuinely loves being active, loves moving, exercise and all that kind of stuff, brilliant. But even if right. there is a little sentiment of you're doing that to avoid, you know, downtime, being alone with your thoughts, um, actually fighting being scared of being overweight, so you're always moving to try and counteract the potential of putting on weight, then you've got to sit down, look in the mirror, and say, look, you and me need to chat now. Exactly. And so to summarise all of this, like I, I've got like three points, which is which is how we do it. You, essentially, baseline nutrition is the first thing. So we get rid of calorie counting. We, what we essentially do is we build a nutritional plan, which is um, a healthy lifestyle plan and it's all portion controlled <clears throat> and once somebody has done a good solid particularly if they, they they're coming from a background like this once they've done a good solid four to six months of uh foundation nutrition or baseline nutrition frequently fat loss occurs in that period anyway and if it doesn't then we can go on to um you know baseline plus nutrition which which i term baseline plus which is to, um, introduced in calorie county and then if needed we can go into advanced nutritional strategies such as carb cycling etc etc but the problem is too many people walk uh, sorry run before they can walk so that people think i need to go on a diet Okay, I'm going to go to um, the 5-2, so intermittent fasting. I'm going to go do um, calorie cycling. I'm going to go do carb cycling. When In fact, all they really need is consistency on a baseline plan. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is mindset. You have to work towards in more towards thinking. So as an example, people are very good at telling me what they don't want. Um, Murray's a classic case. Like he's a, he doesn't want to be fat anymore. He doesn't, you know, he wants to lose weight. Um, people say, I don't want food to control me. I don't want to feel anxious anymore. I don't want to be stressed anymore. Well, that's great. You tell me what you don't want. This is why you're stuck. You don't have a fucking clue of what you do want. So you've got to really think about what you do want more of in your life. I want to be fitter and healthier. I want to be more confident. I want to be um, more calm and assertive in um, high pressure work situations. This is the kind of phrasing that we need to use in order to get yourself out of a stuck pattern. And so ask yourself, what do you want? These are the key things. Baseline nutrition and mindset. What do you want? And then we can start taking steps to move forward out of a pattern like this. After that, do you think it's important when you've identified what you do want to create mantras, meditations, self uh, conscious, sorry, um, subconscious thinking 
around what you do want because otherwise, because I see an awful lot of people, like you say, always say, I don't want this, I don't want that, I hate being fat, I'm fat, all this kind of stuff. Well, that's at the front of your mind every second of the day. I don't want this, I am fat, etc. The way I get over any monkey that might be on my shoulder or my head is always have in my, in my head, this is what I do want, this is where I'm going, I'm aware of the situation but this is how I'm correcting it. Because like you're trying to intimate, you are your thoughts. So if you keep thinking yeah. the negativity and what you don't want, you will have that. That is what you are made up of. We are all made up of our thoughts. So we have to create an environment where we are programming our subconscious to do and move towards the goal. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, there's, there's different, it depends how hardwired like, these things are in your brain. You know, if we talk about, um, you know, binge eating and smoking drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, like all of these things are hardwired into your brain so that your, your brain knows that every single time that you might feel anxious or stressed or you have an anchor in that particular area, um, your brain goes for food or it goes for drugs, alcohol, etc. because it knows that every single time it is going to change your state and make you feel temporarily better. So not only, particularly with food, like not only do we have the physiological effect of sugar mimicking, uh, mimicking serotonin, you know, every time it comes, you mi they mimic serotonin, so they, they make you feel temporarily happy for a short period of time. Or sometimes that state change goes from huge anxiety to just numb. You just don't feel anything. So feeling numb is a better choice for people than feeling anxiety. And it's because they don't know what other, other states to choose. So, you know, if this comes in at a deeper level that you can't just do this by willpower. You really have to focus on what it is that you do want. And there are strategies and stuff that, you know, that essentially they require coaching. And this is, again, why it's important then to have a coach come in and highlight the brick walls that you're heading towards. So, you know, Ben and I have talked a lot about the importance of having a coach. And, you know, Ben and I always have coaches from various different um, you know, backgrounds of whether it's business or whether it's mindset, whether it's training, etc., etc. You've always got to have a coach to help you through these things because you don't know what you don't know. So you can only make the choices of the best of your abilities. So if you choose not to have a coach, then yes, by all means, you know, you can do mantras, you can write things down. And as Ben said, these are classic things that you, you can do to help you step forward. But if you want to fast track this, particularly a case like this, this is an easy case to fix. Like we just need to find out what he wants and then basically teach him some strategies to be able to change, to manage his state effectively. Um, but it's a fairly easy case to sort, but people like this get themselves into such a, an overanalyzed and a, a, like a perfectionist state and it then causes a huge amount of stress in the body as well that they, they just think, oh, I just, I just don't know how to fix it and binge eating is a problem. I just need more willpower. Seeing as we're on this topic and my mind is racing with avenues that we can talk on this, we might as well just keep rolling. Okay. What What's your opinion, and I'm asking you because you're kind of getting well-versed in mindset at the moment. Now, many people use things in and around their lifestyle to help control um, an environment. So drinking, for an example, consumption of alcohol is very common in helping deal with stress and making um, anyone feel more relaxed. It's a relaxant, simple as that. Now, what I think people can get hung up on, now I, I don't have a problem with short-term strategies when there is a mid and long-term strategy in place. Mm -hmm. Example, we'll take a very basic example of sleep. Someone's really struggling with sleep. They come to me and say, Ben, I'm looking to take X supplement to help me sleep. Do you recommend it? I'll say yes and no. No, because I don't believe a supplement should long-term help fix a sleep pattern. Yes, if you're going to use this for the next, let's say, six weeks. And over six weeks, you have X, Y, and Z strategy to control your stress, change your lifestyle, manage your recovery, that kind of stuff. So we look to come off it. It's a short-term strategy. I have no problem with that. Now, the reason why I ask this is because I will be very honest in that there's been periods in my life where I have used alcohol to feel more relaxed. Now, I I get shit thrown at me all the time. I can go through very uh, heavy peri periods of stress just because of 
you know the position that I'm in and some of the things I get in, get involved in. And there's been periods where, let's say for two weeks, I might have had an alcoholic drink in the evening because it has helped me relax. It's helped my mind taken off it. Now I don't get me wrong, have self-justified that action to myself to say, I'm going to do this because at this current point in time, I need this to help my mental state. Now, I know that in two, three, maybe four weeks, my mental state would change because this, this and this is happening and I just need to ride it out. But the short term aid for me for this problem is a little bit of alcohol. For someone else, it might be food, it might be smoking, it might be excessive exercise. I don't know. But I'm talking about alcohol because it's very commonly used. Now, with me, I was exactly right. Three three or so, whatever weeks later, I brought my alcohol consumption right down. I was feeling a lot more positive. The situation resolved itself. I was all good. The problem arises is when you're not honest with yourself about what the strategy you have in mind and you're just lying to yourself. So I could have easily said, I need this, I'm stressed, and the pattern will just continue because I don't actually have a long-term plan to sort it. But because I was self-aware, honest with myself, and was controlling the mid and long-term variables, I was happy as an individual to take that action that could be argued is non-ideal. Sorry, say that again, just broke up that last sentence. I was happy as an individual at that point in time to take the action of, you know, more alcohol consumption because I was aware of where I was going with it and I was mindful of the action that I was taking, even though we could argue that having a drink every night or whatever is not ideal and not the best habit to be in. Well, here's the thing, right? I, I, I love red wine. I'm not averse to coming home. Sometimes midweek, I'm like, oh, really fancy a glass of red wine. I get it. But, you know, I guess the, the, the reality is here is is two things. First of all, um, what do you want in the bigger, biggest, in the bigger picture context of your life? So, and, and this is what you're talking about. Like, you have a long-term game plan. And so is a couple of weeks just having a beer, you know, a couple of nights a week, is that, you know, is that going to be detrimental to your long-term game plan? No, probably not. And also, you're, you're very much in this in state of you knew what you were doing and this is what you chose to do. You, you fancied a beer. That's okay. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, you know, I, I, I'd be, like, full disclosure, like, I love a glass of wine now and again. And do I use it for state management? No, I don't really. But I do fancy a glass of wine, and, of course, it helps, helps you relax at the end of a stressful day. But I think what we have to be mindful of is, and you know, this is to kind of reiterate the point that you just brought across, is that the majority of people, first of all, cannot tolerate levels, um, certain levels of stress. So it's essentially, like, how happy and content you can be as a person is directly proportional to the volume of stress that you can, and uncertainty that you can handle. So if we look at somebody who, and it may or may not be Murray, but let's just use him as an example, if his level of being able to deal with uncertainty is low, then his stress levels are going to be higher because he's going to stress about everything. And this is very true for a lot of women. Women like certainty in a lot of areas of their life, and which is why some people, some women are not very good at dealing with stress. So for you, you've got the, the, the type of stress levels that you deal with. You might like certainty in some aspects of your life, but you're prepared to be okay with more uncertainty. So when we're looking at the bigger picture context of your life, what's happening is that you've got bigger goals and you know that right now, like you're in a stage of like real uncertainty. But every time that you go through a stage like that, you have personal growth. So what you've just been through over the past couple of weeks, if this happens to you again in two or three months' time, you're probably not going to need a beer. You're just going to be like, walk in a park. Mm -hmm. Because if you think back to when you started a business, and, and I think this too, well, when I, you know, let's just go back 10 years ago when I first started um, in business, the things that I thought were stressful then are like literally water off a duck's back now. And I think it's all part of growth and development. And you learn different coping strategies and different uh, 
tools and techniques along the way. And so I do think there's an, an evolution of, you know, what is, you know, of, of these things um, as we go. But, you know, is it right or wrong to have a beer? Like, I, I don't know. You know, there are different ways of coping with things. And, you know, it depends on who you ask. But the truth, truth is, it actually comes down to you and to me and to extreme ownership. And that's that if you choose to have a beer, if I choose to have a glass of wine, we're just fully aware that we're doing it. We just don't do it mindlessly. I think the reason why I wanted to use me as an example is, yeah. is one, no, I'm not worried about sharing my life experiences with other people. That's the idea behind this podcast. Totally. That, that there's no point in me lying to anyone. It's just fucking bullshit mm. if I do. So, you know, and I want to I wanna bring the awareness to the context of my situation because there's an awful lot of people that may listen to my example and be doing the same thing, being honest with themselves, being aware, doing that part of the process, but then lying off the back end of that honesty. I'm doing this and I'm justifying it in this way, but I don't actually have a long-term plan and I know that, but I'll keep telling myself this because it's okay, Mm. because he does it or she does it and it's okay because they've done it. So... All this self-awareness stuff is great. I'm a massive fan of self-awareness. I've been talking about it a lot. But if you're lying off the back end of it, you're just being a dick. Yeah. And when you complain about the results, that's well, you can't complain about the results. We're all in control of every action. So when you come and you, you, you send me a Facebook message and you you know complain about the environment and the situation you've been in and say, Ben, you did this, Ben did it. When you're not being honest about every step, that's when we have a problem. You can't be honest about 50 to 70% of the scenario because the 20, 30% is what's going to fuck you up. That's what's going to get you. That's the bit at the end of the tunnel. Exactly. And it, you know, it's, it's about, you know, full, uh, and again, full disclosure, just like Ben, you know, I, I actually posted a video in one of my, my groups earlier about, um, about work stress and you know that I said um, this morning I went out for a walk um, in the park instead of going to the gym and uh, I didn't sleep well last night I've had you know about three or four weeks of like super heavy work um you know it's been it's been particularly stressful running running outside of Fox down obviously based in Australian time and then you know chase life and everything we're doing here um on London time and so there's there's a lot of stress there's a lot of pressure um you know and we've been like banging out content and I've been changing a a lot that's that's happening in in both companies and I have actually suffered from imposter syndrome this week now imposter syndrome we should probably talk about on the podcast so um whether now it's a diff or a different time but Imposter syndrome is essentially where you become very good at what you do and you become a professional. Um, but there is sometimes an element of doubt that comes into your head that you think, am I just winging this? And do I really know what I think I know or what everybody thinks that I know? And am I going to get found out one day that I just don't know anything and I'm just winging it? And that's what imposter syndrome is. And actually, it's a very common trait of a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners that one day you'll get found out for actually not knowing as much as you claim to know and as much as people think you know. And it's become such a such a thing now that even Wikipedia has its own page on imposter syndrome. So last night, um, you know, I was lying awake in bed at night and I was I just I just couldn't sleep and I had all this stuff going on and I you know you got to call this person do this do this do that. And I woke up this morning and I was like, what am I doing? I mean, I'm like way over my head in so many things. And so the way that I deal with that, oh, uh, oh, and also to add to this, girls, I had a fat day yesterday. And as, as chicks know, like when you're halfway through your cycle and you have a fat day and you have no fake tan on, like shit hits the fan. So how do I deal with these things? Um, the first thing is I did a spray tan last night. And just before I went to bed, I was like, actually, I'm not looking so bad. So that was that problem knocked off. The second thing that I did, the first thing when I woke up, woke up this morning, I was like wide awake at four o'clock this morning, I couldn't sleep. So I got up, scratched off everything that was on my whiteboard and I literally did a massive brain dump from start to finish and prioritized the tasks that I needed to do. And then I basically took myself out for an hour and a half walk and I listened to an audiobook. 
Um, and when I came back, I literally had the document open on my laptop that I needed to do within the first half an hour of being in the office. And I've done it, and I've been more productive this morning than I probably have been over the past three weeks. And that's how I deal with that kind of that kind of level of stress. So it's not perfect. You will never you'll never get rid of the normal human emotions of anxiety and worry and stress in your life, but it's to what degree they affect you and how quickly you can identify it and then prioritize and execute what needs to be done. I think that's why I've taken such a kind of mindset slant and real life slant to this podcast, my Facebook, everything. And Rachel, I know you're the same because the fitness industry is amazing at making everyone feel bad. I don't have stress. I don't have a problem eating the perfect food every day. I sleep at the right time. Like my life's fucking perfect. It's fucking not. No, it's not. And stop telling anyone, everyone, it's not. Like, however, like, I am a very knowledgeable guy. Rachel is a very knowledgeable individual. A lot of the people listening to this podcast are very knowledgeable people. But we all have work stress, lifestyle stress, you know, money, things now and again. We all have that shit. And it's just about preparing for those situations, bringing strategies in place to deal with them them better. And just don't take the pressure off yourself in saying that, oh, I should be able to deal with this in a perfect way. It should be water off a duck's back. No, it shouldn't. I've just talked to you about, you know, stressful event in my life. I managed it better now than I would have done a year ago. And like Rachel says, if this happens again in a year's time, then I will manage it even better but right now, that was my management strategy, and it was short term. It was effective. Now I'm done, and you know we're all okay. So I think you know there's an element of, and this is why I think you've got to be careful who you follow online and whose work you pay attention to, and how many different experts you listen to, because we can get paralysed with stuff. And anyone that paints a nice little picture, picture like the Instagram generation of everyone being perfect they can fuck off but honestly it's just that life's just not like that we all need to be real with what life is really like and the management it's been, you know i don't want to sound silly but when you're an adult life does become more difficult every year i've aged you've got more things to juggle more things yeah. to think about more responsibility i don't even have kids yet you know and people said to me when i was younger and i was spouting all the stuff i was spouting online oh ben wait till you've got kids and i was like bah. and you know it is true. Like there's there's more spanners you get put in the works, the more you are in a way firefighting every day of your life. Oh, I like I'm thinking now that I'm getting married at the end of this year, well in September, and you know, I'm thinking like, oh my god, like am I actually ready to have kids? Like, you know, God, it could be as soon as next year, and I'm thinking, oh my god, how am I how the fuck am I gonna throw a child into this whole mix of things? But you know what? You just deal with it. And, you know, I know mums who've got their own businesses and they've got three kids and a husband to look after and you just do it and you just manage. And like I said, you know, 10 years ago, you know, you know, as a, as a 21 year old, you, you think, oh, I want a business that does this, this and this. And now we have that business. And if you were given that business, just given it at 22, you would never have been able to cope. I would never have been able to cope with the, the, the stress stresses that I do now and so I think it's the same like when you add a child into the mix but uh yeah it's been um <sighs> all that to come I'm a little bit scared <laughs> it is well right uh tell you what we're going to end the podcast there we did have another question but I'm going to knock it on his head because we've been doing nearly 40 minutes already so look um I I really enjoyed that episode. Um, I love being honest with you yeah. guys. I love it when we just talk about the stuff that really matters in life. I think it's important. So, look, yeah. share your experiences with us. Give us a shout on Twitter. Say something. Send us a... Like, just, just engage with us. Like, share your experiences. If this meant something to you, if something, you know, was plucked out the air, you've had a little moment, communicate because... It is nice to know that what we're doing is helping people. It's as simple as that. Um, off the back of that, if you are someone that has never li uh, left a review for me on iTunes, please do that. Please spend two minutes, jump over to iTunes, leave a review. 
Uh, I really appreciate it. It helps more people discover the show. Um, and that's what this show is about, helping people. Um, don't forget, if you want to send a question into this show, then email bencoomba at gmail.com uh, and put in the subject line podcast. Um, find Rachel online, uh, Athletic Fox. You know where I am online. Um, who will be on the show next week? I've no idea. I think it's Alex Manos talking about adrenal fatigue. Um, and... Uh, no, we're talking about chronic fatigue syndrome, I think, which will be very interesting. Um, otherwise, that is goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Uh, and Oh, yeah, and if you're not following me on Snapchat, yeah, and you're on Snapchat, follow me on Snapchat, Ben Coomber. Rachel, are you on Snapchat? Rachel, are you on Snapchat? I am on Snapchat. I am on Snapchat at Athletic Fox. And um, you, like, my Snapchat is kind of like, yes, it's health and fitness, but it's like everything else as well. So particularly if you like wildlife, I go to Richmond Park here in London a lot. And so you'll get lots of snaps of deers and squirrels and uh, rabbits and, and everything else. Because <laughs> I don't have a dog, so like I get my animal fix from other means. All right, thank Okay, you we'll know. end there. Stop looking at me like that. Fuck you, maybe he'll... <laughs> that's quite a confession well I go to the zoo a lot and take pictures of deers and things so yeah if you like animals follow me on I... Snapchat <laughs> no you make me feel weird I, I'd, love to, I'd love to have a cat I can't have a cat because David's allergic to cats so I, we can't have a dog because I travel too much so anyway that's why I go to the park so I can see the animals so there we go the zoo's well fun I love it. but zoo. yeah follow me on Snapchat yeah follow us on Snapchat Ben Coomber and Athletic Fox uh, right, that's it from me. I'm out. I'm really excited to be on the road and tour soon. Seeing many of you people. If you haven't got a ticket, grab a ticket. Um, the Ben Coomber UK tour it is on Facebook and all sorts. Look it up. Otherwise, I'm out. I'll speak to you on Monday. Rachel, that's us. Ciao. Ciao. Hey everyone, Ben Coomber Radio, episode number 200. Yes. That is episode number 200. <laughs> yes. Ah, ah, ah.